morning, everyone. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Jennifer Caddick, Stephanie Weiss, Kate Mahoney, and, and everyone at Save the River for inviting me here and, and taking care of me, making sure that all the logistics went smoothly. Um, you know, there, there are some people who say that the International Joint Commission is this, uh, this isolated international organization completely unaccountable to the people, and I'm sure we'll hear more of that in the coming months. But the fact of the matter is, um, we are a small organization, we don't have our own enforcement officers, and everything we decide, we count on the governments in both countries to carry out. And what, in a very real way, whatever power we have comes from you. And by that I mean that, um, We've solved some difficult problems in our history, and whenever we have uh, asked the governments to do anything really difficult, the role of citizen engagement has been vital. It's been, it's been crucial, in fact. And this was, uh, has never been more true than with this current decision on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. So I know that, that many of you are familiar with the IJC, so I'll make this really brief. There's a map in the, uh, at the documents table that shows our activities from coast to coast. We have responsibilities that, that do go beyond the Great Lakes. And we were established by the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. And though it's 100 years old, this is, it's just remarkable how relevant the principles in this document still are today. There we go. So for example, in Article 4, the two countries commit that they will not pollute the waters on either side to an extent that would injure health or property on the other side. And one of the things that the, uh, one, of, one of our jobs under the treaty is to do studies for the, the two governments when they ask us to look into an issue. And quite often this has been to look at water quality issues. And when we do, um, this is not just a, a statement of purpose, that's an actual standard that we use to judge the adequacy of the solutions. The other job that we have under the treaty is to approve projects that would affect natural levels and flows of boundary waters, such as the um, hydropower project in the international section of the, the uh, St. Lawrence River. And again, in that capacity, we have two main responsibilities. It seems they always give us two jobs, I don't know why that is. Um, but the first one is that when we approve a project, we will not permit any use that conflicts with one of the uses that um, are listed as having a higher priority. And this is, the first one is for domestic water supply and wastewater treatment. The second is for navigation. And the third is for power and irrigation. Now people ask, well, where is the environment? You know, isn't this, isn't this obsolete? And the answer is, is no. Um, um, if we permit a use, for example, if, if the dam is to be regulated to provide flood control, that's a use we are permitting, and that would show up on this list, uh, presumably after those other three. Um, however, the environment is not a use that we're permitting. We don't, we don't give a, a permit to the wetlands and the fish. Um, that goes to our second responsibility in approving projects under Article 8. And in this case, it says that we will make suitable and adequate provision to protect or indemnify any of the existing interests that could be injured by the project. So when a dam goes in, we look at the interests, and <coughs> Um, some of them might be injured by the uh, construction or operation. We make provisions to uh, ensure that they're protected. Um, and um, basically, that, that's uh, the core of our responsibility is to make sure that the interests, um, all the interests, I mean, there's a dozen of all the interests, are. Um, in both countries, upstream and downstream, are protected. So, a um, little bit of history. Um, in 1952, the two federal governments applied to the IJC to build the, the International Hydropower Project. 
And their purpose was to generate electricity and to make it possible to build a seaway. But we had also <coughs> experienced a flutter record in the system. So they asked us, would it be possible to regulate the flows through that project in order to reduce the rainfall levels on Lake Ontario and provide benefits to the, the shoreline property owners there? And we came back and we said yes. That could be done as long as the water supplies coming into the system were not more extreme than those we had experienced up to that time, uh, which was 1954 at that moment. So if the supplies weren't more extreme, you could regulate the lake to within a four-foot range. And um, jump ahead quickly here. This is uh, the letter from the governments asking us to do this. Um, and some of the, the folks who are, are critical of our new plan are saying that, well, this, this was a social contract that we would keep the lake within a four-foot range. And if you go to the, the website of the Lake Ontario Riparian Alliance, which is very critical of the new plan, uh, they will cite this as, as the, the reference showing that there is a social contract. But again, what, what they don't say is that in prefacing the request to us, the very first word of the letter says that we are to have regard to all the other interests in, in looking at this, this question. And um, so, you know, a person could argue that a lot of the development that has happened since, since this letter was written in 1952 has come after the fact and, and maybe it, it shouldn't be considered. We, we don't take that position, but I don't think anyone could argue successfully that the environment wasn't there in 1952. So therefore, even after the fact, under the treaty, we're required to make some provision to address the injury that's occurred. I'm going to back up here for a second. This is just a very quick tour of the system. Um, of course, you have Lake Ontario. And then the, the Moses Saunders Dam, about 60 miles downstream from the outlet of the lake. This creates different hydraulic portions of the system. You have the upper river between the lake and the dam, and then the lower river below the dam. And you'll also notice that the Ottawa River is a prominent feature flowing into the St. Lawrence at Montreal. Here on the upper river, um, the Thousand Islands area, um, the water levels are, are very much influenced by the, the level of Lake Ontario. Um, right here above the project, you have Lake St. Lawrence, which is actually was created by the construction of the project. And the levels, in, as you get closer to the dam, are, are more influenced by the flows that are set through the dam. The whole project, of course, includes the Moses Saunders Dam. Um, there's, there's Iroquois Dam, and then there's a spillway at Long Sioux Dam, um, and you know, there was some dredging that was part of the project as well. If you look at the lower St. Lawrence River below the dam, you can see that it's uh, geographically kind of complicated, and here it is where the, the Ottawa River comes in at Montreal. So it's always very important to remember that the water levels and flows and the fluctuations are primarily driven by natural factors. Um, rain, snow, runoff, evaporation. And these are things that we don't control. The, uh, the one point of control we do have is at the Moses Saunders Dam. We control the flows um, through that. And that has an important influence on levels and flows. But, but primarily, the fluctuations are driven by nature. And setting the, uh, the uh, flows of the project has different effects on different parts of the system. And it has a much more pronounced and immediate effect on the river than it does on the lake. We can see here that with a hypo hypothetical flow increase of 10% of the average flow, which, which would be a very big flow change, after one week, that amount of flow increase with lower Lake Ontario by a little less than an inch, but at Lake St. Lawrence, uh, just above the dam, <coughs> and Lake St. Louis, a part of the river down by Montreal, the impact would be more than 10 times as much. Of course, it would lower the, the level above the dam and raise the level below it. 
So, um, let's take a look at, at what regulation has done. And, and one thing I would say is that um, back in the 1950s, when we, we studied this question, we really believed that, except on very rare exception, we could keep the lake within this four-foot range. <coughs> And you might, some of you might be aware that, that after the Seaway was inaugurated, there was a this documentary with, with Walter Cronkite, who was a narrator, and it was called Completing the Job That Nature Started. And, and this really reflected the mindset of the time. Uh, not only could we control nature, but we could do a better job at managing the resource. So, what you see here, um, this is 1960 when regulation began, going through uh, almost to the end of last year. The black line shows the actual recorded water levels, and the blue line shows the levels on the country that would have occurred without regulation. And we can see that there have been very significant reductions in the extreme high levels that would have occurred. And this, is, this has provided uh, very substantial benefits to the folks living on the shoreline. Um, and there also have been uh, reductions or, or some moderation in the extreme low levels that would have occurred without regulation. And this has been good for um, recreational boating and navigation. Um, and you know, there have been benefits, of course, for hydropower. And, some protections for the folks downstream as well. But we also noticed that the water level has gone above the four-foot range on a number of occasions since regulation began because the water supplies coming into the system have been greater than those that were experienced in that, that historical period of record up to 1954. So nature has had some surprises for us, and it's a uh, has made it very clear that um, going outside of this range is not a rare event. It's, uh, you know, it's happened on average uh, every 10 years. So this is something that, that everyone needs to expect and that communities and individuals should no longer be making investment decisions based on the belief that you can keep the lake within the four foot range because it's, it's just an unrealistic proposition. <coughs> Um, there is, there was one other big surprise as well. Um, as I mentioned, the, the regulation of levels and flows has provided very substantial benefits to a number of interests throughout the, the basin, but it also had severe negative impacts on one of the interests, and this of course is the environment of Lake Ontario and the Upper St. Lawrence River. And uh, it's, it's been particularly pronounced on the coastal wetlands. And Doug Wilcox is going to talk to you in, in, with much more authority and in greater depth uh, uh, later today. But I was asked to, uh, to give you the Cliff Notes version of how this works. So that's what you'll get here. Um, essentially, the coastal wetlands are a, uh, a living, dynamic system. The, the compositions of plants and, and you know, the, the location of different zones, changes with, with fluctuating water levels. But in the scheme of things, if you look at uh, sort of the long-term um, uh, cycles of succession, you'll have a high water event which will come and flood out um, some of the area that is becoming dominated where, where the trees and shrubs and woody upland plants are moving in and moving into the, um, the marsh zone. Um, so the high water keeps that in check. And then following the high water period, the levels recede and they expose the bank. And in the bank is, are these, this variety of seeds that then can germinate and give you this, this tremendous diversity in what we call the wetland meadow marsh community. And the receding water levels also keeps the cattails in check from uh, moving into this uh, meadow marsh zone because they require a lot of water. 
Well, what's happened is that in regulation, of course, the, the highs are not as high, so you have uh, more of the zone occupied by, by the woody plants. And then when the levels recede, they don't recede as far. So you have a lot of shallow areas that are left with standing water, and it creates perfect conditions for the cattail monoculture to come in and take over the zone that was uh, formerly occupied by this much more diverse and biologically important wetland meadow marsh community. Now we all know that, that agricultural runoff and urban urbanization and other factors have impacted our wetlands, but the history and the patterns of water levels, um, of flooding and dewatering are the, the predominant effect factor that determine uh, the composition of the plant life in the, the coastal wetland. And we'll see an uh, example here. This is uh, very close to home. Eel Bay is uh, in, um, in the Thousand Islands. It's uh, surrounded by, by Wellesley Island State Park, so it's uh, more buffered from, from these other human impacts. And, and we can see very typically the effects of, of regulation on wetlands. We look here in 1959, there was a considerable area occupied by the meadow marsh community and some cattails. But if you look at this imagery uh, that's developed from aerial photography over time, you can see that the wetland meadow marsh is decreasing. Um, it's uh, becoming almost completely dominated by cattails. And then in 2001, the last year where we have this aerial photography, there's uh, some recovery in the meadow marsh, but I think the, the overall trend is very clear. Um, so one of the other problems with the current approach is that there's no systematic way to review things like this, to review the, the changes in conditions, to review how our, our regulation plan is performing, and to keep this knowledge base up and then evaluate whether changes are needed. We're, we're basically just stuck until we do another great big study. Um, so fortunately, after, after many years of, of wrestling with this, and I'm actually going to really fast forward through some history here. Um, you know, in the 90s, we a lot of problems with, with the regulation plan were coming to the forefront. IJC wrote to the governance in 1999 and said, we have all these problems, we need some money for a study to look at this. They, they gave us the funding at a uh, major international study from 2000 with a final report in, in 2006. The IJC took out a proposal in March of 2008, and uh, as Jennifer mentioned, after the public hearings, we, we withdrew that proposal. We went back to the government, and we said, okay, let's work together and figure out what you can support, and then we'll take that out again to the public. And um, this past Monday, we released the first detailed uh, sort of slice of information on, on this new plan and this new package um, that we think, and we're very confident that this addresses the, the problems of today, helps us prepare for the challenges of tomorrow, and strikes a more appropriate balance among, among these interests, not all of which were considered at the beginning. So what are the elements? Well, there's a, a new regulation plan. It's called Plan BB7. That simply means it's version 7 of Plan B, B that was developed in the, in the study. It mimics natural flows to a greater degree than the current plan, but it's still moderates those extreme water levels. And we'll take a look in detail a little bit later at what that actually means. A very integral part of this uh, new package is an adaptive <coughs> management strategy, which will give us a tool to uh, adapt to change and improve performance over time. And then there's some enhancements to the governance function as well. Um, our Board of Control will have new responsibilities. Um, it will be a somewhat newly reconstituted board. They'll have a role in adaptive management and a mandate and funding for improved communications, both with basin stakeholders and the basin governments. And uh, there'll be a new order of approval. Now, 
some of these are, haven't been put out for public review yet. We've, we've put out everything we've been working on today. We think that the basin needs some time to, to really digest all this new information and try to understand what it really means. But we are working on a new order of approval, which is the, the basic policy document that contains the criteria and the conditions that must be followed, and, and that will be put out for review at a later time. Um, so what are, what are the benefits and trade-offs of this new approach? Well, for the environment, we would expect to see substantial improvements on uh, Lake Ontario and the Upper St. Lawrence River. Um, without significant change in that lower portion of the river below the dam. And the reason for that is there's already um, more variability in that part of the system due to the inflow flow of the Ottawa River down there and other tributaries. In terms of coastal property, the new plan still very much uh, has a goal of uh, reducing the severity and, and frequency of those extreme high water levels. Um, however, to, to achieve the other objectives, it can't do that quite as much as the current plan. So there will be some increased costs to um, shoreline property owners, and we'll, we'll look at that in a little more specificity too. Again, on the lower St. Lawrence River, you don't see any significant change because there's not much change in, in the variability down there. For recreational boating, um, there's, there's some different results. Um, there will be a longer fall season in some years because the new plan doesn't have this dramatic drawdown in the fall. Um, however, because there's more variability, um, there will be lower summer levels in some of the years on Lake Ontario and the upper St. Lawrence River. In the lower St. Lawrence River below the dam, there will be some, some very minor improvements. So, what does this all mean? Let's take a, a look at, at some of the specifics. Okay, this first graph looks at average water levels. And it takes 101 years of data, that's the 20th century, from 1900 to 2000. And you take the actual water supplies that were received during that, the 20th century, and then we route it through a model that simulates the regulation plan. And what you end up with, this shows what the current, the average levels over the course of the year, the black line is the current regulation plan, um, and that's what it would produce. <coughs> the, green, the green line here is plan BB7, and you can see that at the summer peak, it raises the average level by about an inch, and in the spring and the fall, it's a couple of inches. Uh, but if you look at the average levels without regulation, they're, they're very substantially higher, and you can see that in terms of average levels, the, the new plan looks a lot more like uh, the old plan than it does the unregulated situation. So when we say we're mimicking natural um, flows to a greater extent, you have to understand that in context. Okay, these are the uh, famous spaghetti charts, which most people either they love these or they hate them. But this is Alexandria Bay, where, where we do have a gauge. And this is the current, the model of the current plan, 58 dB. And then again, we take the same water supply record of the 20th century, but this time, each of the colored lines traces the levels that would happen in one year of water supply. So this is what the current plan looks like, and you can take a look here at the upper extreme in Alexandria Bay and, and the lower extreme. But one thing you notice is that over time, I mean, there are some years in the upper end and the lower end, but the levels tend to be really more tightly grouped in this, this narrower range, and of course you have this pronounced drop-off uh, right at the end of the summer. Now we'll look at the same scale and the, the same uh, water supply data, and here is what you would see for Plan BB7. The 
again, the upper levels, there's uh, just a very small increase there. Um, there's, there's a bit, bit more in the lower end of the range. But sort of in this middle portion, um, you've got more variability from one year to the next. And then this is the main feature of the plant. Um, and it's, it, it is hard for people to understand what that means, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a mental picture. And, and you can see that this decline in the fall is, is for the most part, more gradual. Um, I'm going to flip back and forth a couple times, just so, kind of like if the eye doctor is just going to see which, which one looks uh, better. Here's the uh, current plan. Here's the new one. The current one, you can see the type of group, new ones, and the wider spread. You can look at the upper end. There's a great deal of change. Look at the lower end. There, there's some, some years where it's, it's pretty low, but it's, it's not a lot of years. Then we look again at Alexandria Bay. This is what would happen without regulation. There's uh, substantially higher levels and a great deal more variability, which is to be expected. And, and you know, we, we do need to protect the shoreline. We do need to, to look after human interests. So we, we can't go back to this. Um, and, and what we're proposing doesn't, doesn't really look that much like this, but um, it does have this, you know, variability and, and, and closer uh, mimicking of natural patterns. Okay, so um, what does this all mean? Uh, we, in our study, developed um, indicators that were used to analyze the performance of the different plans. This is the, the first part of, of the environmental performance indicators. This is one of the many tables that are probably going to make you glaze, but we'll go through these really quickly, and I promise during Q's and A's we can go back and look at these in more detail. Um, the main thing here is that you can see the baseline is the current regulation plan. All those values are set to 1. And then B7 over here, um, you can see that uh, the numbers in blue are improvements. And the key indicator here for the wetland meadow marsh community, it shows a 44% improvement. And that's an important number, so try to hang on to that one. And what that means is that the area occupied by uh, wetland meadow marsh um, during some of these years following this, this uh, high and low water cycle would be 44% greater than it would be under the current regulation plan. And that's, uh, I believe, about a 5,000 acre of wetland increase um, over a base right now of, of about 13,000 acres of meadow marsh, uh, but it's, it's not the exact numbers that are the most important thing here. I mean, uh, Doug Wilcox has done some, some more recent work that shows that there's actually even a, a larger improvement. The main thing is, is, is that we were confident in the, the magnitude, the order of magnitude, and the direction of these changes, and what it means. You can see that um, some of the uh, bird indexes on Lake Ontario also show improvements. This, this one indicator, by the way, also includes the Upper St. Lawrence River. Here's the other indicators on the Upper St. Lawrence River. There are some important improvements. Uh, muskrat house density uh, shows a substantial improvement, although not near as much as you would expect under the unregulated scenario. Northern Pike Year Young also shows significant improvement. And then looking at the lower river, again, all the numbers in gray are, are no significant change, and that's the case. Again, we don't, don't see much um, change in the lower river. But, you know, I'm, I'm asked frequently, well, you know, why is this important? Um, why, why, you know, does this 44% wetland meadow marsh matter? Um, why, why do we need to make this change? And you know, the answer that I give is, first of all, restoring the, the uh, chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the Great Lakes is the national policy of both governments, the US and Canada. Um, they've put some, some very big bucks into this effort. 
And the, the coastal wetlands are just a critical component of this ecosystem. Um, they provide very important services, uh, filtering pollutants from runoff, buffering the shore from uh, erosion effects, um, but also the, the diversity and health of, of the, the coastal wetlands is important because um, basically, you know, every every water bird, all the fish, all the 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 insects and amphipods and critters that form the base of the food chain, um, the amphibians, um, and the mammals that live, live in the coastal zone or on the lake, um, all spend part of their life cycle, nearly all spend part of their, their life cycle in these coastal wetlands. So it's, it's not just, you know, the plant species composition, we're, we're really talking about the health of the system. And, um, Again, it's, it's not just these indicators we see here. These were chosen from among 400 environmental indicators at the beginning of the study because we wanted to pick the ones that were in their own right ecologically significant, that were sensitive to changes in regulation and water levels, but that also represented other indicators and, and gave you a picture of, of the health of the overall system. Okay, so now we'll look at, at some of the economic analysis, um, very quickly here. Um, these numbers uh, reflect a, a integration of a whole lot of information, of looking at um, where properties are, you know, there was a survey of uh, all the, the uh, marinas in the system and, and public boat slips, so there was all this information, new information that was gathered in the study that allow us to assess what these changes in water levels mean. Now again, the current regulation plan is uh, set to zero. That's the baseline, and the numbers in red would be um, impacts where the benefits would be less than, than the, uh, under the current plan. So we can see for the Lake Ontario coastal zone, um, you know, while they are still getting very substantial uh, impact uh, benefits from, from the new plan, um, there'll be a slight reduction in those benefits. And, um, you know, what does that mean? It's about, about 10 to 12 percent less benefit than they're currently receiving. And it's mainly on Lake Ontario, and it's mainly in the area of maintaining shore protection structures, so seawalls and, and stone revetments and this sort of thing, which, which have to be maintained anyway in most cases, or they will fail over time, will now have to be maintained a little more often because of this, this variability within the range. Um, there's a, a slight <coughs> increase in flooding impact, but really most of that benefit from, from flood control still remains. So, uh, looking now at recreational boating, um, you can see that because you know those, those few years where there are lower water levels in the summer, that has an economic impact, and that's in terms of reduced opportunities for boating. It's not really looking at things like, like uh, breaking your propeller. So we can see that, that most of this is on Lake Ontario. There's, there's a small reduction in the benefit at Alexandria Bay uh, and the Upper River, and again, slight improvements below the river. Um, and you know, one thing is that uh, the summer sort of weighs more heavily in economic analysis because uh, there's more boating in the summer. So while there is improvement in the fall months and more opportunities for boating there, that doesn't show up in the economic numbers as much because there's more business in the summer. And, and I'm not an economist, but um, you have to wonder that maybe if, if conditions are better in the fall, if, if people might stick around. You know, maybe they think there would be more uh, economic benefit that time of year. <coughs> it's, it's something to think about. Um, looking at the commercial interests um, of the new plan, both uh, navigation and hydropower do a little better, able to generate some more electricity um, with this uh, new plan. 
And one thing I'd point out is this is what we call our stochastic analysis. Um, and all that means is that rather than looking at that 100 years of water supply, we took those 100 years and using a computer, we generated a much longer sequence based on the 100 years, but it says what happens if conditions were a little drier in some years or a little wetter. Um, you know, if the droughts were a little longer, if the wet periods were longer. So, so this uh, stochastic analysis has got some more extreme circumstances than that, that 100 year supply analysis would, and so the impacts are a little greater. <clears throat> um, another way of looking at this is to look at the actual frequency of water levels at certain elevations. Again, here we have Alexandria Bay. These are water level elevations here in the years and the feet. Here we see the unregulated scenario of the current plan and the proposed new plan B+. And what this shows you is that, let's say you pick an elevation here at 247 feet approximately, um, there's 92 times uh, you'd be above that level under BB7 and 25 times under the current plan. And what we're talking about are the number of what we call quarter months in this 100-year supply sequence. Now, quarter month is kind of like a week, except that there are 48 quarter months in a year instead of 52 weeks in a year. That's the way the analysis is done. Um, and so this is 25 quarter weeks and 92 quarter weeks out of this, this whole sequence of uh, uh, 100 years. Now, this is actually just looking at the April 15 to October 15 time frame for each of the, those 100 years of supply because that's that's an area, a uh, time of year, which is uh, very important to recreational boating. And one thing we've also done is we've highlighted the levels that our study found were most uh, desirable for boating in a particular part of the system. So in Alexandria Bay, this is a range from 244.4 feet to 247.2 feet. And when you look, when you count up the quarter months that are within that desired range for this whole hundred years, you'll see that under the new plan it's uh, 2,126. Uh, under the current plan, 2,171. It's about 2% difference. Um, you know, and that's the kind of number that, that gets lost in the noise. So the, the actual total number of, of weeks that are available for voting doesn't change that much. There are some lower levels in the summer. I mean, these are all things you have to, to think about in a way and, and, and <coughs> try, to, try to get your mind around. Um, mention that, that this may include an adaptive management strategy. This is um, very quickly the kinds of things that the strategy is committed to monitoring. Of course, we're going to look to see if the environmental benefits are what we expected. We're also going to look at whether our, uh, our findings about the sensitivity of shoreline property to water level changes are correct. Um, how boating adapts to the new water level regime, I like that area on the upper river. And whether in fact the, uh, the benefits do remain the same below the river. And then we also are going to keep an eye on water level supplies to uh, maybe help improve our forecasting and therefore our ability to regulate um, and also to see whether there are any any patterns, any trends that are emerging that would indicate that maybe we're moving outside of the current climate regime. Uh, next steps in this process, uh, you know, we put a lot of information up on the website. We hope people will, will take the time to, to really look at that. But uh, as more information becomes available, uh, we, we will be making that available as well. Uh, in pretty short 
term, we expect to be able to put up a simulation of how the new plan compares to the current plan from 2000 right up to the end of 2011. And there was a meeting uh, just this week to do the peer review on that simulation, so that should be out soon. Um, we're going to uh, again have this information out for some time for people to, to digest, and we're having public information sessions around the basin in, in late spring. We haven't set exact dates yet. We hope to announce those soon. It's going to be what we call the Web Dialogue in June. That's, that's a four-day online event. It's very structured. It's an agenda. There's different discussion topics. And there'll be a variety of, of experts on these topics who will be participating online so that people will uh, have a chance to ask uh, you know, some of these questions, really drill, drill, drill down on some of these questions with people who are, are much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, and then, uh, this is all going to be put together with the draft order of approval and the other parts of the package into a formal proposal that we'll put out for public comment and we'll have uh, formal public hearings with, with the six commissioners attending. And so any comments, we're taking comments on an ongoing basis, but those that we get by June 15th can be factored into developing this formal proposal. And then we'll hold public hearings, hopefully this year still. Um, and then the last step is that we will seek the concurrence of the two federal governments for implementing a new order of approval and regulation plan. This says you can get to the the, the website I talked about, right from the IJC's main page, it's just a couple clicks away, or you can go directly from IJC.org forward slash L-O-S-L-R, that stands for Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence River. We'll take you directly to that site. And again, I, I thank you so very much for the opportunity, and I'd, I'd be very delighted to take your questions.
was work done on climate change. There was work done to you know, develop a, sort of a more regional model based on, on the, the young global circulation models. And then each of the plants that were developed in the study were tested against those climate change scenarios, um, as well as the, you know, the historic supplies and the stochastic supplies. And um, by the way, the stochastic supplies, even though they have some extremes in there, they're considered to be within the, the regime, the current climate regime. But these plants were tested against these um, climate change scenarios. And, you know, in some cases the plan fails, or the current plan fails. And um, there's been more work done in our upper Great Lakes study, which is just concluding this spring. Um, again, sort of refine this, this regional look at, at climate impacts. And so we'll have some new tools available to analyze plants like BB7. But there's no, there's no consensus on, on, on where the climate and water supply trends are going. I mean, we, we expect certain things like uh, you know, the timing and, and the severity of rainfall events and, and things that, that will have an impact, but the big picture is unclear. And that's why this adaptive management strategy is so very important. And that's one of the, the uh, key reasons for, for having that. So, that we can not only uh, get an early indicator of when we might be trending outside of the current climate regime, but then seeing what's, what's actually happening on the ground as a result, and, and you know, basing our evaluations and possibly changes in regulation on, on real information. Uh, yes, sir, in the second row here. So it looks like, <coughs> based on the data you showed us, that um, this plan has net benefits for the
newspaper saying this must be a disaster for wetlands, the water levels are going low. Which I responded, no, we've been waiting for 30 years for this to happen. And he said, well, what's going to be the impact on our town? And my first response was, how much of the economy of your town relies on the fishing and the recreational fishing industry? So, well, everything, I mean, our grocery store, our gas stations, hotel rooms, everything is based on that. He said, so if you have a low water level that restores the vegetation and wetlands, the water level comes back up, which is going to do. And you have all that um, now newly revegetated um, wetlands with little bugs in it. The little fish are eating little bugs, and bigger fish are eating the, uh, the small fish, and then the real big fish that people want to catch are eating them. You better be ready because when this happens, you're going to have an economic boom that you're not going to understand. <laughs> and the point is for recreational voters, if you are running around in really fast boats over rocky areas and don't fish, that you're going to, you may have problems. If you're a marina operator that pulls a marina you know, in the wrong place where there's not enough water, there shouldn't be enough water, water can be held high because of regulation, you're going to have trouble. But if you are using your boat and you want to go fish, this is the plan you want. Thank you. <laughs> Slide 17 shows three curves. Um, uh, yes, that one there. Um, it was my understanding that uh, the seaway had actually shifted the period of high water. And that would appear to show that, that was, uh, I guess I'm, I'd like to know what your view is. It has the has there been a shift, substantive shift of the timing of high and low water from um, pre-project to post-project? Well, I'm again not intimately familiar with all the, the history of the hydrology. But just looking at, at this chart, uh, the black line uh, as compared to the, the blue line, it, it does appear that the peaks uh, occur at, at slightly different times of the year. I was under the impression it was more dramatic than that. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, but I know there was discussion on the management part of this, and there might be changes uh, to the board of control, to the advisor, uh, to the etc. Are those things going to be announced to the public, the proposed changes? Yes. And what yes. will they be getting later this year? Yes, we're, we're working on a paper that, that would describe the for, for regulation, and that will be part of the information that's made available. Um, yes, ma'am. Regarding the adaptive management plan, um, I was wondering if the details on that and the workshop that they have, is there any particular ranking of the different interests that you're going to evaluate? And I mean, would, would maybe influenced by those original three interests, the domestic, sanitary, navigation, and power. What, what would be the rankings for adaptive management? Is there some wiggle room later for changing the whole thing a lot. Um, there are a couple questions in there. Let me take them in sequence. Um, the sort of the, the outlines of an adaptive management program have been scoped, um, and you know the availability funding being what it is these days. We our team working on this has looked at what they consider sort of a, a core program and then um, a more complete program. And so there is, is some prioritization of um, um, what, what would be monitored and evaluated. Um, actually, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of interest in looking at the um, changes in environmental conditions because that's um, probably the most difficult to predict and has you know the most factors that, that are influencing it. So um, we, we really want to understand 
that you know we say this plan is, is creating the conditions for, for this restoration. We, we really want to understand if, if in fact, um, our findings and assumptions are correct. Um, beyond that, I, I, I'm not really sure what, what, the, uh, what the other priorities would be. Um, in terms of, and, and I think you're asking about the treaty and, and if, if we're going to make changes, what, what would guide our considerations? Is that, is that correct? I guess so. We have the potential to shift. Right. Focus later is not so rigid, and it goes for 60 years, like before. Shift. So I'm wondering. No, that, that's a really, really good question. Uh, something that, that hasn't been worked out yet. To be perfectly honest, these are these are the kinds of policy issues that that we're struggling with that will be reflected in a draft order. You know, the order contains sort of the conditions that have to be met, and what, what guides the, the actual operations, contains insur assurances in there. One thing is that um, because the federal governments were, were so closely involved as the applicants for the project, and um, um, you know, they were very involved in, in setting, setting the goals for regulation back in the 1950s. That's, that's why we said we would seek their concurrence before making any changes. And as the, the two signatories of the treaty, uh, they would certainly have, have a strong say in, in any changes that were made in the future that might, might sort of uh, shift the priorities or, or change the goals somewhat. Although, um, I guess another comment is, is that we don't see this new approach as changing the goals that were set in the 1950s. Um, I mean, there's still a very strong goal for flood protection. There's still a need to look at all interests that would be impacted. It's just that, that one of the main interests uh, was left out originally, and, and well, actually more than one. Recreational boating isn't specifically addressed in the, the 1956 order either. Um, so, in order to look after all the interests in both countries, um, it you know it does require a slightly different balance of, of benefits that come from regulation. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, later this month, the Great Lakes Maritime Community Symposium is held every year in, uh, in uh, Cleveland. I think I've seen you at a couple of them over the years. Uh, will you or the IGC be making a presentation at that symposium? Um, we, we've not been asked to, but I'm sure we'd be happy to if, if we were. Um, yes. Um, in reference to economic benefits, has there been any analysis of how the grants, uh, the programs that are trying to restore wetlands and spend them, you know, millions of dollars on trying to bring the environmental system back to where it should be, was there any analysis of uh, how that money could be saved or has it, you know, spending less money on some restoration since the water level? Well, that's that's a, a great question. Um, there was a, a very major debate at the beginning of the study um, in terms of whether, when you looked at the environmental conditions, whether you would try to look at some of the economics related to that. And uh, at the end of the day, they thought, no, we, we really better focus just on the things that are directly related to water levels. But um, it's well known, and, and uh, New York and Ontario in particular have, have made it clear to them that, that they've made major investments to restore wetlands, and you know they've kind of hit a wall. They, they can't get any more uh, restoration under the current regulation plan, and they, they've shown us, uh, you know, we, we toured some in Ontario, where um, there's actually sort of these engineered solutions where um, um, there's, there's pumping and a, a control structure put in behind a, a barrier and you have, you have a coastal wetland where they artificially regulate 
water levels, and then they have seen improvements as a result to going toward a more natural regime. But you don't get all the benefits from that um, because it's no longer connected to the lake then, and you don't have the fish coming in and out and, and other critters as well. Um, so, no, that, that analysis hasn't been done, um, but it's very important. I don't know, Doug, if you want to add any observations? A comment, on this. Early on, there was a push in the study to put an economic value on, on the environment, that one's in particular. And we resisted that because um, it's, it's very difficult to put a dollar number on a wetland anyway, but when you tie it to the cost or the, the perceived short-term economic benefit of building a new shopping center, you're always going to lose. I, I didn't make very many friends uh, with this statement, but I commented the, the benefit of the shopping center is very short-term. The environmental benefit or disbenefit is very long-term. So let's put a value of a wetland at one dollar per acre. But if you destroy it, you destroy it forever, so you have to multiply that number by infinity. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the adaptive management plan again. Yeah. The, in a high water event, the economic impact on human structures and things like that is going to be fairly immediate. and. Whereas the economic benefit to a wetland will be much longer term and take much longer to show up. So it seems like the clamor that will happen for adaptive management, if you get a couple of high water events in a row, is going to be overwhelming. And so I'm wondering if the adaptive plan has any ideas or for systematic reviews for every 10 years or something like that. Um, boy, that's, that's a good question, and, and there's, there's so many levels of detail about adaptive management that you just can't get into in a presentation like this, and that I'm really not uh, in a good position to get into anyway, but um, adaptive management is, is, was never conceived of as something that you would use to change the way you regulate from month to month or for, from year to year. It's really looking at performance over the long term. And while that hasn't been completely worked out or defined yet, you know, we sort of notionally said, well, maybe every five years you have sort of a scientific conference to look at all the findings in, in a public setting and, and see what, what, you, uh, what you're observing and, and what what further evaluation may be needed, but that's a good point um, in the back there. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Michael Doctor, I'm the Jefferson County Legislator representing the Clayton Defensive Police Chairman of that board. Now, I have been networking with my colleagues on this issue, and we will soon be introducing a resolution supporting EV7. Um, the Jefferson County Legislature certainly recognizes the importance of restoring uh, the St. Lawrence River and the eastern basin of Lake Ontario to their historic or near historic um, water levels and fluctuations. So we'll be gathering more information and networking with colleagues, but I foresee a resolution coming out of this as early as midsummer uh, supporting this plan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Domestic 
and approval processes. However, um, the management of flows through the project, um, that portion of the approval project um, is, is left up to the IJC. So, for example, the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC license for the NYPA project, will state that, that the flows will be managed through this project in accordance with the IJC's order of approval. Um, so, I guess that answers part of the question. Now, going forward, um, if there are, are changes to the regulation plan, um, it really doesn't affect um, the domestic licenses um, based on you know, the magnitude of the changes um, are going to affect. And they have a lot of conditions in their domestic license. Um, you know, they've bought easements, they've done this, they've done that. Um, none of that should be affected. Um, but as I mentioned, the IJC is committed to seeking the concurrence of the two federal governments before it implements a new order and regulation plan. And so that's a process that would go through uh, the State Department and the Department of External Affairs on the Canadian side. Um, and basically, those two agencies, which are, you know, in charge of foreign policy for each federal government, would would uh, run whatever uh, domestic review they need to do, and then they would um, either concur or not. Yes, sir. Um, I'm to understand stuff. Okay. What you're telling me is that uh, in the uh, August, September, October period, they're going to they're going to cut back on the hold of the one that's on the street today. Is that correct? That, that's all you. That's all you. Yes. Yes. There won't there won't be this drawdown. Okay. And currently, currently, we have. Go ahead. I'm sorry. How, how is that done? Is that uh, is this regulation on top of the Constant flow rate that goes through all the trillions to generate power. Is that a constant there? And this, this water that should be either let out or hold back is the quantity of flow that could go through this on top of the When you say you're going to cut back on the flow rate, that's not implying that they're going to like turn off turbines or close gates and, and decrease the amount of hydro power. That's a constant flow rate. Well, I don't know that much about how they operate the plants, but it is the flow through the hydropower project that we're talking about, and, and all of that flow does go through the turbines, except in, in really rare events where there's too much flux and they have to spill some of it, but that hardly ever happens. Let Tom Brown answer the question. Oh. Well, I, I think he answered it. Uh, I've found Brown and uh, Thank you, uh, Doug, for uh, putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, really, the, uh, I think the answer to uh, that in terms of uh, whether it has a, a negative impact uh, is in the, the economic part of the study that shows actually hydro, uh, somehow these flows, and I'm not a hydro expert, uh, somehow these flows under the uh, new plan will uh, uh, generate uh, by the ability to generate uh, a greater capacity of, uh, of power. So I don't see any negative there. Uh, there are flows down at uh, certain periods of the year that that uh, flow varies uh, depending upon uh, supplies to Lake Ontario. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, negative hydro hydro negative impact, uh, and it all looks positive. So I think that's a good side, the hydro side. And if you probably want to know where I'm speaking from, uh, I happen to be on the International St. Lawrence River Board of Control, and uh, we deal with the uh, review of these uh, flow levels uh, almost uh, daily, and, uh, and the board reviews those on a weekly basis. But Frank, while I'm 
I do have the floor, but I'd like to point out, coming back to uh, the regulation plan uh, slide that's on the screen, uh, you talked about the very important aspect of uh, rejuvenating the productivity of the wetland communities uh, and the importance of uh, getting back to a uh, more productive biodiversity complex. What I'd like to also remind everybody of is that middle green line is terribly important when you look at what it means seasonally. And uh, for wetlands to uh, be usable uh, during the uh, uh, fall, spring, and winter months, uh, you really need to go into that uh, with some degree of saturation in the wetlands in order to allow muskrats to set up their lodges for the winter, to allow for enough saturation for overwintering success of a whole range of uh, aquatic organisms that Frank mentioned earlier, amphibians, uh, reptiles, the whole, uh, whole gamut of uh, the, the, floor, the floor that uh, we'll be able to uh, sustain uh, life throughout the winter period. And that green line in the uh, uh, fall and spring are terribly important uh, to the occupancy of these wetlands uh, in the fall, uh, especially for uh, the muskrat population that uh, will have enough water to move in and establish themselves. And then you can see the levels uh, uh, will, will uh, increase uh, over the winter period. So you'll have enough water, we hope, uh, in these wetlands with this threshold a little bit above the 74.6 at both the spring and the fall. And in the spring, this is terribly important because it will ensure enough uh, water level in the marshes during the spring of the year when uh, fish, certain fish populations will access those uh, wetlands for uh, spawning purposes. So not only do you have the biodiversity improvement and all of the uh, aquatic uh, benefits that go along with that and the uh, uh, forage base, uh, the food base that uh, we just heard about, uh, but now you have a situation where uh, uh, the uh, community of uh, larger organisms can access and successfully overwinter throughout the wetlands uh, because of that really a minor change, but a terribly important change because it makes the wetlands accessible to uh, fish and wildlife populations during the fall, winter, and spring seasons, which uh, is in, uh, terribly important to the success of the overall life, life uh, uh, life pattern of those uh, uh, fish and wildlife populations. So I just wanted to point out, uh, Frank, how important that slight change is in terms of making these wetlands uh, habitable throughout the winter months, spring months, and fall months, and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, access to those wetlands that has not been the case uh, in the past. And if you look down at uh, the levels going in in the fall and the spring below 74.6. That 74.6 is, is, is kind of the dewatering level in our wetlands. And you'll see the average, most of uh, the wetlands are dry uh, during that uh, under the current regulation plan, as opposed to uh, uh, a 74.6 meter that begins to make those wetlands accessible uh, throughout the winter months and uh, inhabitable throughout the winter months. That's terribly important, and that's a major benefit uh, from a fish and wildlife productivity standpoint of the new regulation plan that's been proposed. Coming back to uh, that question, uh, I don't know whether I answered it uh, because I, I don't know for sure uh, the specifics of the hydro side of it, but it seems to me that there's been, to my knowledge, no complaints uh, and they're positive about the added benefits in the new plan. So all I can say is the any flow changes that may be derived would be minor and uh, not uh, uh, of an impairment level for hydro. Doug, go ahead. A straightforward way of looking at the hydro benefit of the new plan, proposed plan, during low water supplies and there's not much water coming into the lake, in order for to maintain the lake artificially high under 50 ABD, no water, uh, less amount of water goes through the dam. If you let the lake go low and supplies are low, that means the water goes through the dam and it's producing power. 
producing power that would not have been produced on the 458 BV. So they get a net benefit from it. That's, that's looked at that under the microscope and in, in, uh, in tweaking 
plan BB7 and the analysis around it. Time for one more question. Uh, yes, please. Here. I'm trying to understand the process <coughs> politically a little bit better. Okay. So if Plan BB7 was passed, what is the time um, allotted before it was reviewed again? I'm thinking back to examples like the Eel Bay pictures that you showed us and the information you were giving us, like 44% improvement. 5,000 area of um, meadow marshland um, being refurbished. And that, in my mind, takes years to accomplish. So how, how long do you have before it's reevaluated to give the fishing population a chance to recover? Well, when, when the IJC issued its order in 1956, one of the things it did was to retain jurisdiction over the, the management of flows. So, um, you know, I think when we, when we take a decision, that decision is in place until we change it. Um, again, the adaptive management, we're thinking notionally of looking at things every five years. Um, I don't, I, you know, I would, I would not anticipate making any major changes after the first five year period. It's, you know, merely to take stock and, and, and just see if things are trending the way we, we would expect. Um, so I don't, don't have a specific answer for you, but I, I think that, that everyone appreciates that some of these are, are longer term processes. Uh, I think we're going to sort of take a little pause here and break for lunch, but before we do that, I wanted to um, point out a couple of people um, because we have some time to chit chat over lunch um, and uh, specifically uh, take a minute uh, to recognize the efforts of New York State in all of this, um, in this whole process, uh, particularly over the past few years. Uh, New York State has been really, our understanding is sort of in the behind, um, behind the scenes in the process, been a really important driver. Uh, not only um, building some of the science, uh, and I know a lot of you know Steve LePan, uh, who is the, the regional fisheries director with the hatchery for um, Department of Environmental Conservation. And he's been a really critical player in the science. Um, I think it's really quite impressive that a lot of our local resources with our CDC staff and also SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, a lot of you know John Farrell, um, the director of the biological station out of Governor's Island, a lot of our local researchers uh, that we know and we see in the grocery store have been intimately involved in this study, so we have a lot of really great local expertise here. Uh, and I also wanted to recognize um, Judy Drubicki, who is uh, our New York Department of Environmental Conservation um, Regional Director. Um, and uh, Judy, I don't know if I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about New York State's role. Or the only thing I want to say at this point, because the governor has not yet been briefed on this, and it's still very much a very active topic of conversation within the department, but as general, we've had a lot of work done. I don't know where we would be without Tom Brown. I mean, even historically, and how it's gotten to where it is today. But yes, the department is extremely engaged in this process, as I think most of you know. The only thing I would say is, in this group here, there's probably a pretty general consensus on this new plan. But I think you should be very, very aware, if you're not already, that that's not the case all over New York State. That being, because of that, I think it's very critical that when the public comment period is very active, that, that Save the River maintain its involvement in it, and all of you as individuals maintain the important, recognize the importance of getting your comments in, making them as good as they always are. The letter that was recently uh, written by Save the River and the World Wildlife Fund and Environment. It's excellent. Keep up the good work. I think that, that this is not over until it's over. And we, we all know it's got a long and tortured history, and hopefully it will be over soon. But please make sure to stay very actively involved in this effort as it continues. That's really what I want to say today. Thank you.